Let's turn to Luke chapter 2. If not, don't worry, it's a familiar story. And uh, we're going to continue on in this Advent theme and actually on into Christmas Day. And it's in Luke chapter 2. And I'm just going to read some verses from verses 8 through 20. It's all about the shepherds and the angels. Now, on the lead up to Advent, we've looked at uh, Zechariah, the priest. Do you remember Zechariah, the priest, in the temple? And has he made this offering before God? 400 years God hadn't spoken for. There he came at the time to offer the, the, the prayers for the people. Advent, uh, was it um, the Feast of um, Tabernacles? It was Tabernacles time, wasn't it? Anyway, and he, and he came in and he's making this offering before the temple. Now, his priestly division were on duty. It was the only time he would ever get a chance to do this. There he stood in a temple at the Holy of Holies before the massive curtain that actually blocked it off. And actually, God was meant to dwell in that spot near, and they couldn't actually get in there. And there was this altar outside, and there he would burn the incense. And the incense, as it rose up, it, it demonstrated the prayers of all the people going up into the presence of God, offering their prayers and asking for forgiveness for the next year to come. So it's a very, very important time. And while he was there, an angel appeared to him, and we talked about what that experience was like for him. Last week, we talked about Mary, funny enough. You should have been there last week. That was fantastic. You know, Mary um, had an appearance of an angel, but it was almost like, you know, the angel appeared like someone walking in the, in the back door. You know, it was a real, a real shock for her. But actually, he appeared in such a way, and it was, it was great, actually, to suddenly meet these angels and realize that these heavenly beings aren't just all about light and loud voices. They're actually coming a guys that we can understand and relate to, and they can communicate to us and actually calm us down just a little bit. Then we come to another incident of angels here in verse 8 of chapter 2 of Luke's Gospel. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. And here he is again. The angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. <clears throat> you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared and with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. Arise, shine, for your light has come. You can almost see this choir of angels, can't you, singing that? It's fantastic. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see that this, is, that this has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what they'd been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and, pra glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Fantastic story. Really exciting stuff, isn't it? And you're trying to get into the mind of these people. <clears throat> I don't know if you heard the story of the nativity play at the school. And uh, it was primary school, and uh, all the kids were getting ready, and they were all wanting to be selected for a major part. And, of course, you know, it's done, it's done on a lottery basis nowadays because there's always one kid that's a really good actor, and there's always a kid who just cannot get the words right. So the teacher done it, and they, they finally got young Joe... And, sorry, Joe. But young Joe, <laughs> young Joe, he, he was six years old and he, he wanted desperately to be a king. So in the end, she agreed to let him be a king. And so they had the nativity play and everything. And under practice, they came up and he said, you, Joe, are frankincense, all right? So what he said, he said, gold I bring to the king, myrrh I bring to the king, and all you can say is frankincense I bring to the king. She thought, he can't get that wrong. So, as they went through a dress rehearsal, gold I bring to the king. Myrrh I bring to the king. And young Joe came up and said, Frank! Frank. Frank Furter. Frank Furter. And then she says, no, no. Frank in sense. Say it slowly. Frank in sense. Say it with me. Frank in sense. It's, it's easy. Okay, so, and he got it. Gold, a king, to the, bring to the king. Myrrh, I bring to the king. 
Frank, Ian, said, excellent, well done. Anyway, the day came, mum and, mums and dads were all there, everyone's taking pictures, and they did have permission, by the way. And, and you know, everyone's dressed up, and you've got the obligatory tiger and lion and everything else that comes along with nativity place. Parents all excited. And then come the kings. Gold I bring to the king. <laughs> Myrrh, I bring to the king. Frank! Frank. My teacher's sitting there going. And he goes, Frank! Frank Furtis, Frank Furtis. And says, um, and he walked over to the crib and he went, Yeah, don't he look like he's dead? <laughs> and that is the point, isn't it? That is exactly the point. You see, our reaction to the birth of our children is almost a, a heavenly thing, isn't it? And it would seem from our reading that we're actually in very good company because God himself went to great lengths to pass on the good news of the birth of his son. Now, hands up if you've been a parent. Hands up if you've been a parent. Right, well, you've been parents. All right, Dad, all right, well, you just put your hands down. Gentlemen, tell me, were you excited? Hands up if you were excited at the birth of your firstborn. Right, well, I tell you what. When my firstborn son was born, well, I tell you, one, I couldn't believe it was a boy. I didn't want a girl, I wanted a boy. And <laughs> the whole thing was a bit of a nightmare. I think, I think Mary was sort of milking it a bit, to be honest with you. <laughs> 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 you know, there she was, she woke, up, she woke up and said, oh, I think the baby's coming. And I said, you're joking, this time of the morning? <laughs> she said, no, no, I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm, you know. So anyway, I said, right, in the bath. She said, what? I said, you can't go to the hospital dirty. So I made her have a bath. <laughs> then, I, then I actually got a dress and I had her case ready. Everything was ready. Got her out of the car. And she stood there. And it was snowing because it was February. And um, she stood there. And I got this great picture with a big bump and everything else. And I said, she's going, we you hurry up? And I said, just, uh, just wait a minute. I got the car. <laughs> and I did an Ian Brown. <laughs> Every which way. I didn't have Facebook at the time as it would have been there. So we got her in the car. But I had this old car. Um, and the problem with this old car is if you wound the window down, the window used to fall off the rack, you know, so I had to get the window up. Also, the reverse linkage had gone on the, on the gear, so I had, to, I had to make sure I pointed it in our direction. And also, the battery was flat, so I borrowed the battery of someone with some jump leads. So, got her in the car, took the battery out, jump started the car, put the battery back, and off we went. Got her to Dingwall Hospital, and when we got to Dingwall Hospital, they said, Oh, it's a big baby, that. Um, I think you need to go to Ragmore and Inverness. I said, right, okay. So, um, how long have I got? She said, don't stop for a fish supper. I said, right, okay. So, <laughs> off we went. Now, this little Datsun I had, it did 50 mile an hour at maximum downhill with the wind behind you, okay? <laughs> you know, and I don't know if you've been to Dingwall, but when you're climbing out over the Conan, you know, you've got to climb, and the car was down at 20 mile an hour. And, mm, anyway, finally got there. Oh, I didn't tell you about the car park. Because I par parked in forwards, I not only had to jump start the car, then I had to push the car back, and then I had to get, anyway, we finally got there. You know, and, the, you know, and then we, we got her in, and this is what I cannot believe. They're so awkward women, aren't they? I got her, got her in there, you know, and uh, as we got in there, she stopped performing. I said, what is this about? You know, I've got things to do. <laughs> 18 hours she hung out for. Why did you wait that long? <laughs> anyway, at half past ten at night, our son was born by C-section. And when they brought the baby out to me, and I had him for 15 minutes in my arms. And you know, that's the quietest I've ever been. <laughs> I, was, I was absolutely speechless. Because there I was, holding this baby in my arms. We'd, this was from us. It was a magical moment. And when I, I remember Mary coming, coming into, the, into the ward, and of course she was groggy with the, and I said, Mary, it's a boy, it's a boy. And she said, I don't care, let me see. <laughs> <laughs> is she in here, where is she? Oh, she's on crash, is she? Oh, she's there, she's there. So anyway, yeah, so then I had to go home. And of course, I got home at 11 o'clock at night. It's what, yeah, 11 and a half past something like that. What am I gonna do? I've gotta tell someone, haven't I? So what I did was I picked up the address book and I phoned everyone in our address book. And everyone was pleased for me. Of course, by now, it's good on for midnight. Where can I phone? I know. So I've got the phone book and I started on a 
And about four o'clock in the morning, I got to letter R. But there were so many abusive responses. <laughs> <laughs> the birth of children is a wonderful thing because we can see all of that potential as we hold them. And as we hold that perfection, you know when you're looking at their fingers and toes, you just wonder at it, don't you? And you know, the birth of Jesus, just as we were told this morning, was just like that. Of course they knew he was going to be the Messiah. Of course they knew. But you know, they were just taken up with being new parents. They knew that he would make a big difference to his family circle. They knew that he was going to make a difference to his nation. They knew that he was going to make a difference to the world. But they didn't realise that he was going to change history forever. And that's why we're here. And that's the joy of Advent. That's what it's all about. As God actually comes in and meets us on a level that we really understand. Shepherds in the Middle East, they were the despised class. They were the, the rough element. And because of their unsociable hours and because of the strict religious laws that were in operation, they actually weren't allowed to go to the synagogue on a, as, on a regular basis unless they went through a ritual cleansing first because they've been working with animals and all that kind of stuff. They were also always suspected of thieving. They probably smelt a little bit. And they were the folk of society that... Well, they were tolerated and they were on the fringes. They were the people that were in society but not of it. Now imagine, shepherds, plural, they met up one night, the sheep are secured in pens and they're sitting around the fire and they're sharing their stories and their jokes. And this was a good time, you see, because these were friends that they could rely on in an emergency. They all shared the same job. They probably helped each other out. And there would, of course, be the friendly banter and everyone would take their turn at being the butt of the joke. Because, you know, sheep are unpredictable creatures, aren't they? And they can embarrass you at the best of times. Huh? Funny, I remember when I, I was a young serviceman, came out of the service and I got a little job working on a farm that we were living and I helped them at shearing time. Have you ever done shearing sheep? <laughs> oh, it's easy. <laughs> you know, and basically, I was given the tups, the tups of the male sheep, and, of course, you're supposed to get them by the horns dead easy. You go and buy the horns, you pull them back like that and you drag them across. It's dead easy, you know. Well, I thought that until I got carried around the pen and everyone stood <laughs> laughing at me. <coughs> now, you can imagine the sort of laughter and jokes these blokes are having. And a good thing, you see, about meeting up like this was that everyone could get a reasonable kit because they would share the watch. And so, there you would be, on watch, a time to reflect. Those quiet moments when... Well, all you've got is the sound of the night. But then your imagination starts running wild, doesn't it? When the darkness suddenly comes upon you and you feel like you're going to be sucked in. And then, then you start to surface and rationalise everything. And then you start asking the same old questions that go around your head. Is this it? Is this as good as it gets? Why wasn't I born into a different environment? Why have I got this set of problems? Why have I got these emotions to deal with? Why couldn't I just win the lottery? All the things I could do with that. And I'd be good with it. You know, I'd give 10% away. Then the shepherd looks at the stars and the moon and he thinks only another six hours and it would be sun up, the sun up. And well, life is always a bit better when the sun shines, isn't it? Have you noticed that? But then he looks up again and he starts looking at the Milky Way. <coughs> the expanse that he's seen a hundred times before, and he thinks, you know, there's got to be more to this. And then suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Could you imagine the brightness in the darkness suddenly wakes everyone up, terror grips them, and you know exactly what fear is like. It spreads like wildfire. And it's catching, everyone's going, whoa, whoa, what's, happening? what's happening, what's happening? You can imagine it, can't you? And then it catches because the animals then catch on to that, and the animals start their noise, and the noise must have been incredible. I mean, have you ever lived, has anyone else ever lived in a country here? Okay, well, you know what it's like, don't you? When, you know when they, when they separate the young from their mothers? And their mothers, the noise is incredible. That's what it would have been like. It would have been a din. It wouldn't have been the holy scene. Oh, I am terrified. <laughs> Fear not, said he, for our mighty dread had seized their troubled minds. Okay, that's important words. But the fact is, it wasn't formal like that. 
It was a frightening experience. The noise was deafening. And then the angel speaks to them and he says to them, look, don't be afraid. I've got good news of great joy and it'll be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And then suddenly this great company of the heavenly host appeared. And they start singing, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. I think it's pretty high on the wow factor, isn't it? Imagine the scene, imagine the atmosphere. Here they were, just ordinary folk. We're just shepherds. No one cares about us. No one ever talks to us about it. And they would have learned in the synagogue as children. And their parents would have told them about God and his angels. About how he was going to provide a Messiah one day. How the oppression of the Romans was going to be lifted one day. And here we have yet another picture of the grace of God as he accommodates ordinary people and reveals himself to be the extraordinary God who meets us where we are physically and spiritually. He knows where we are. He knows what we believe. He knows what our understandings are. He knows what our bias is. He knows everything about us, but he meets us right at that spot. And these shepherds never really expected more from their life other than to raise sheep and be a despised group who lived in, with this ghetto mentality. They thought that that was the way it was. This is the way it's meant to be. But don't be fooled. That's not the way it's meant to be. Being a Christian, you know, is a lifestyle, not a life sentence. Any hint of God... For these men, well, that was for the priests and the teachers of the law and the so-called respectable people. God is a way out there somewhere and he's only interested in others. He doesn't speak to the likes of me. But now God has chosen to speak to them and this was great. Not just one angel, but hundreds of them. And they're singing so beautifully, he can't take it in, can he? Any emptiness that they might have felt, all the doubts that they had, everything just evaporated in an instant. And now they knew that this was where they meant to be. And the emptiness gave way suddenly to an expectation. Look at verse 15. When the angels had left them and they'd gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing's happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. What a night. If the angels appearing had been incredible, just think what it would be like if they could see the Messiah. Could it get any better than that? Now we are told that they hurried. Now this is a very significant word actually because in their society, running was not regarded as dignified. It's true. You know the story of the prodigal son? And the, the picture that's drawn there is of the father running to meet the son. I'm, I, you wouldn't do that. That was actually letting down your guard. It's like if you're not a tactile person, actually receiving a cuddle. They just couldn't wait. And they hurried like excited children, longing to see what God was doing. And what a change. These were just suddenly changed men. So much so, much so that the people were amazed at the difference from being the sort of slightly shifty characters and unpredictable people that folk would expect them to be, there's something in their eyes that seems to draw folk to listen to what they have to say. And quite incredible, really, when we consider that when Jesus chose his disciples, he chose people that were unknowns as well. And it was through these anonymous people that God has turned the world upside down because it's not the great gifting or ability that counts, but what God is interested is in a heart that is willing to follow and to be faithful. And the fulfilling part of, his, of this story is that they'd been accepted as they, as they are. And God had loved them for their own sake, even though they were shepherds. God loved them. And that's exciting because, you know, as we transpose this truth into our own situation, we suddenly catch a glimpse of the fact that anything is, impossible, is possible. That God could love even you, 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 and you. <coughs> you know, excitement 
excitement's something that characterises Christmas, or it used to be before it started in, in April or something like that. Mm. And you know exactly what I mean if you've had the three o'clock in the morning experience with your kids. Has anyone had that with their kids? Or are you, or are you mm. oh right, good, it's nice to hear. You know, and I, I remember, it never stops, does it? You know, we actually tried all kinds of mechanisms. We've tried taking them to the pictures um, on Christmas Eve, wearing them out, taking them for a long drive after them, giving them something to eat when they get home and they're so overtired, then you put them up in and think, great, you know, they're busy, and they're up in the morning. We've tried absolutely everything. Then we came on this idea, well, if we leave a little present at the end of their bed on Christmas morning, they've got something to play with, that would give us half an hour, wouldn't it? So when our, one of our sons came home on leave, he was going to be going off to Iraq, and I said to him, what would you like for Christmas? He said, I'd really like a harmonica. I think I'd be really good. He hasn't learned it, by the way, but he said, I'd something I'd like to learn, because I can keep it in me, in me day sack. He said, and if I get five minutes, I can, you know. I said, what a good idea. So we went out and bought him this very expensive harmonica. And I said to Mary the night before, what Christmas should Santa Claus leave at the end of his bed? And she said, his harmonica, he'd be chuffed with that. So. 21 years old. I left it at the end of his bed. <laughs> Five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> All that extra effort you make in being interested at three o'clock in the morning in building a Meccano set. Trying to fix the watch that won't stop that beeping noise. The inevitable noisy toy, which is the favourite of all of them, the pop gun, my father tells us, I said, I used to have a gun, I don't remember this, but it was a gun with ping pong balls in it, five ping pong balls, and, and he said, in the end, he took all the ping pong balls away, he said, oh, you lost them all now, because <laughs> I was everywhere. You know, and then the, na the next round of chocolate has passed under your nose at that time in the morning, and when all your senses are telling you that normal people are in bed at this time in the morning, you see, these shepherds, they got it. And it was all that they could do to secure their sheep because no one wanted to stay behind. Having been given the details as to where they look, the shepherds set out, not content until they find the place. And if you look at verses 17 and 18, it says, And when they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. I wonder... If when they came to the came to the stable and they met Mary and Joseph with this young baby and they're, they're sort of wide-eyed anyway and they walk in and said, look, I'm really sorry to bother you, but an angel told us that you would be here. And they said, really? And they said, yeah, so it is true, Joseph. And I wonder if they got a cuddle of the baby. Even shepherds, the outcasts, the people who didn't regard themselves as particularly religious. They had a cuddle of their saviour. And I wonder if they actually saw him as he took his journey to the cross and remembered that day when they held him in their arms. Mm -hmm. See, having found the family in the stable, they just felt compelled to tell everyone who would listen to their story. You know, when I met Jesus, I just couldn't help myself. And I ain't got over it yet. Mm -hmm. You know, because when you meet him, you just want to tell people. They wanted to tell everyone about the angel. They wanted to tell them about the great choir that appeared. They wanted to tell them about the great signs and the promise that they found the Messiah, just as they said it would be. And it didn't matter to them if folk didn't believe them. They didn't care if people ridiculed them. This moment had moved them from feeling that their lives would always be the same and stuck in the same mindless routine year in, year out. But now their lives would never be the same. They would actually be better shepherds now. Because now they had a purpose. God himself had reached out and touched them and made them whole. And there's one thing for sure. This will be the best Christmas they ever had. Will it be yours? Let's pray together, shall we? <coughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ, born in a stable... We pray that today you'll be with the poor and the homeless at this Christmas time. Our Lord Jesus, born of Mary, we pray that you'll be young, with young mothers across the world this day. Many are frightened. Many are surrounded by a loving family, but 
all of them taken up with a sense of privilege and wonder of new life. Our Lord Jesus, visited by shepherds, would you be with all who have to work this Christmas? And those who long for work, Our Lord Jesus, you who became a refugee, would you please be with those who fear for their lives today? <clears throat> 